First piece of advice is if you want to get rich, don't go into forestry. Uh, and although a few people have violated that rule, by and large, the, the profession of forestry delivers a lot of quality life, but it doesn't deliver uh, being rich quick very well. Uh, I've already touched on the idea of the collegiality between foresters around the world. Uh, and this includes foresters from countries where either mad at or actually actively at war with, as that's been one of the most rewarding experiences, is working with Chinese foresters or Redwood or Russian foresters or uh, German foresters or people like that, is the forestry thing is more important than what their government's telling them. So if you want that kind of satisfaction, forestry is a good place to go. It's also kind of a dangerous perfection. And we have, I'm sure, a number of good statistics that uh, forestry is a good way to get killed if you're not careful. Uh, so if you're worried about, you know, worrying about going out into a dangerous site and getting hit by any one of a number of things that might kill you, and they range from grizzly bears to logs rolling down hills, uh, forestry is probably not a very good idea. If that sounds like a good idea, forestry is a terrific idea. Well, the first thing I would tell them is you can't get a better, better education by taking one of those two areas, forestry or natural resources. My bias is forestry because I believe that you get a better cross-section. The thing that has always bothered me about natural resources as a collective been to put people in, they go to school to be a natural resource manager, is the intensity of the training that goes on in the different resource areas. And I've always been biased that forestry presents a better opportunity to have a better understanding of those resource areas, as well as being done in a collection of an aggregation point. That's not to take away from natural resource management courses, though. But I would encourage him to do that. I can remember when I was on the Baldy District, uh, I had a young kid come to me and wanted to know what I thought about his going into forest management. He, he had, subsequently ended up going to Colorado State. Uh, what I told him was this, because he had two or three other areas that he was considering, and he voiced those to me. I said, from my perspective, you will get a better, well-rounded education in land management aspects if you become a forest management student as opposed to diving off in these other real specialty areas that you're thinking about. That's still up to you. It's what you want to do. What do you want to do when you get your education? How, what, how you, what are you going to do to apply that education? What, where, and when? So that's how I handle that. Uh, I've spoken to a number of different schools about programs. Um, I've found that as a collective whole, they listened. In most cases, they were polite, but I always felt in the end that I gave it a good shot, but the end product is not going to be a student going into forestry or some similar science program. That's not that positive. That has kind of a negative connotation to it. But I think that People that want to go into the land management arena, particularly as a forester, that you can't find a better, better educational platform. It's all science driven. That's the first thing I tell them. It's a science driven program. You've got a lot of things to memorize and learn. It's not like reading a book. It's not like being in an educational course. Uh, so uh, those are the things that I've tried to impart when I've spoken to young people. Well, they're not going to make much money as a forester. That's for sure. sure. Uh, and my advice would be is get your basic forestry uh, and then specialize in a field. Like in my own case, it was economics. You interviewed Bill Libby. His specialty was genetics. Other people do soil science. Uh, so it's a good idea to 
to get your basic forestry degree and then develop a specialty. That's a great way to go. You know, the thing that's intrigued me about the field of forestry is the diversity of opportunity. Because no matter what your interest is, uh, you can find a place for it in uh, the field of forestry. And it's this diversity uh, because you could be interested in the actual practice on the ground. You could be interested in the science aspects. You could be interested in the economics or the policy aspects. You could be interested in the quantitative aspects. And what I found particularly rewarding, particularly as a, as a faculty member, is interacting with geneticists and physiologists and economists and policy people. It's a very broad field. And so one thing that I would find of interest to make sure young people understand is that forestry isn't just timber management or putting out fires. It's a, it's a very exciting, broad field. And it's becoming increasingly exciting as its complexity uh, increases. And so anybody who has interests in the way forest ecosystems work on a biological level or a societal level or a quantitative level, there's a very special place for you in this, this field, which I found interesting because of its breadth. And its breadth brings complexity, and complexity brings the need for very special skills. Yeah, I spent three years uh, working on an SAF group in which uh, I was one or two people from the U.S. in what was an international thing, trying to figure out how much forest and how much wood we were going to need in 2050. Um, we did a lot of arguing, much by email. Um, we came to a lot of rough conclusions. We came to only one conclusion that we all agreed on, which was something interesting. And that one conclusion was that we we're going to need a lot more wood and most of it would be produced by plantations that were efficiently grown. Uh, and I don't think that idea has sunk in yet, either in the profession or in the broader science. So this idea of saying, uh, we'll go back to a hunting and gathering society, uh, let the forest do what they want to do, and we'll go take what we want from it, uh, is probably not going to work, and it's going to fail before 2050. Um, and that worries me. Uh, we have the technology to grow a lot more wood. My time in New Zealand was particularly instructive in that the plantations they were growing in New Zealand then, which was largely Monterey pine, um, had about 10 times the per hectare productivity of wood than their native southern hemisphere forests. There's another interesting question, is why do our western forest trees grow so much better than anybody else's? Uh, but they do. So. Getting back to California, one of the really important things about California is as a source of trees to be grown in much of the rest of the world uh, for their benefit, because our trees are really better than theirs. So here's a number to think about because it's interesting. Uh, Monterey pine and redwood and a couple of other things, Monterey cypress in New Zealand grow at about 10 times the rate per hectare that their native trees do. And so if you convert some forests into plantation, for every hectare that you turn into plantation, you can set aside roughly 10 hectares of native forest as parks and reserves and end up with the same amount of wood. That's a powerful idea. Uh, in California, that number is not zero, but it's nothing near 10. It's probably near one and a half or two that if we were to convert substantial areas of California into efficiently run plantations, we could probably set aside a couple of acres of native forest for every acre that we put into uh, our, a carefully run plantation. Bob Powers, who and one of, I think, the important contributors to this idea in California came up with a number of estimates uh, based on 
how, how much we could produce, how much wood we could produce if we would shift to a carefully managed plantation. Well, as I told a good friend of mine that we were asked during a council December meeting in the big room, which is the one I referred to as, I felt like the room of ghosts with all those past presidents. Where do you see forestry going? And I told Bill Banzeff and the group, I see forest management practiced worldwide in 100 years. Because the question was, where do you see forestry in 100 years? That was my answer to it. And Bill says, do you really mean that? And I said, yeah, I do. Uh, California is a phenomenal state with a phenomenal amount of different vegetative communities that is both private, industrial, and federally handled. The management of it is extremely complex. I think about my time on the Baldy District, which is a district that is, for the most part, covered with chaparral chemise. It has timber up in portion of the district up in the high country. Uh, but you look at the impact on that forest. Obviously, fire and water are two major recreation, or not recreation, two major resource areas that impact the management of that district. But the other aspect is you've got a lot of recreation. You've got recreation that comes out of the LA Basin that wants to come up and use the canyons, San Gabriel Canyon being the major one. Uh, there's the Dalton Canyon, San Dimas. Uh, you've got tremendous special use permit summer homes. And then you've got some permanent residences in the Baldy Village. And as a consequence, you've got all these different interests in that one little three or 400,000 acre ranger unit. And it's quite an impact. Uh, it's a challenge down there. You've got that Southern California political water impact as a predominant one. Well, we went through a very tumultuous uh, period with environmental groups wanting to control the forests. Uh, but I think we've got that handled. The Forest Practice Act in California um, has settled down uh, and uh, is a good background for, for a, a good uh, basis for managing private lands. Um, we think we've managed to deal with the demands of environmentalists in a rational way. And so I think uh, we've made good progress there. And on the national forests, the poor forest service is still handicapped by numerous assaults on their ability to, to manage the forests. But little by little, the public and the courts are beginning to realize that the U.S. Forest Service is doing a good job given the restrictions imposed upon it by, by Congress and NEPA regulation and uh, the various acts that uh, Endangered Species Act that control federal activity. So I think things are going to be are going to be good. They're stable now, and I think they'll stay stable. To me, I would fall back on the old saying that the welfare of society is dependent upon the welfare of forests. And historically, you can go back and look at the Mediterranean region, for example, and which was covered with forests, but the need for forest products uh, particularly for the manufacture of bronze and the manufacture of glass, the manufacture of boats. I mean, the armada and the, uh, the sailing ships required enormous amounts of wood. And so a lot of forests have been very heavily harvested 
and some of them have been almost eliminated. And so I think this, this concept of there's a basic link between the welfare in society and the welfare of, of forests is, is basically underscores this field of forestry. Can you imagine living in California that doesn't have any trees? Can you imagine living in California where all the forests have been exploited and you know they once were but they're not there anymore? And so the important mission of the broad field of forestry is how do you manage, in this case, the Sierra Nevada, such that it can continue to provide this broad range of values that society expects. And of course, the ultimate issue is one of of providing public policy based on balance. How do you balance the values of some group of society that wants to turn it all, all the Sierra Nevada into one giant park? as opposed to some other faction that may want to utilize all the forests for products. I mean, obviously, the polar extremes are untenable, and I'm not interested in spending time debating the polar extremities. What, I'm, what fires me up and concerns me is how do you affect balance? Because I would respect everybody's values as a given. I'm not going to challenge values. But in developing public policy, I'm interested in how do you affect some political compromise that enables a balance? How much park is enough? How much wood production is enough? How much habitat for something or other is enough? Now, this is, there's no answer, of course, to this question. But that's what makes forestry so critically important in a state like California was particularly with a growing population, the issues of sustainability become that much more complex because we can't talk sustainability if the population's changing all the time. And so what I think is essential in providing educational programs and and management programs and policies, how do you maintain and sustain a wonderful natural resource that's renewable while accommodating this spectrum of values. It's, and that will be with us forever. It will require sharp, competent people being involved forever. In a perfect world, my idea, my idea of a perfect forest would first be at the landscape level. We're not talking about a little chunk of land now. And at that landscape level, I would have some native forests where native animals and plants and bugs and everything else is free to go on living the way that it was. And I would also have some very highly productive plantations that would be producing the wood and eventually, I think, the lignochemicals that are going to replace petrochemicals um, being produced effectively. Um, And various things in between. places where recreation of various times happens. So it would deliver the whole thing at a landscape level, landscape being roughly defined as a big chunk of land in which you have the room for these different things to go on. Um, I am not much of a nativist, as I'm not really offended when California trees are used in some other country or when some other country's trees, let's say eucalyptus, is used in California, I welcome them. Uh, They probably increase diversity. Uh, And I've already said I don't really worry much about diversity. In Europe, this is particularly important because if you look at California, or for that matter, North American forests, per unit area, we have about three times as many uh, tree species, maybe only twice as many, as they do in the same size area in Europe. What happened there? Well, I think probably the direction of the mountain ranges is important, is here our mountain ranges run from north to south, and in Europe they run from east to west. So when we went through the last dozen or so life, uh, excuse me, ice ages, 
an awful lot of the European forest species got, went to extinction and ours stuck around. So European forests are much simpler than American forests. And yet they're pretty nice forests. So adding North American trees to European forests not only seems like a good idea from the standpoint of productivity, it's a good idea in terms of returning those forests to the level of diversity they had before we started the Pleistocene area. Well, in my perfect world, I'm going to have to talk about a timber type because I think that best projects that. Uh, I think what I see is a forested stand, and I'll just put it here, ponderosa pine, Jeffrey pine maybe, one in which you have a level of carpet regeneration that typically gets wiped out with the rotational aspect of fire. Uh, it has maybe some intermediate crown, pine, not very much, and you have an overstory component of probably some place in the magnitude of 50 to 100, 50 to 70 or 80, maybe that many mature trees on it. Now, some of those trees might be in clumps to accommodate a wildlife perspective. Uh, when I say that, I'm thinking of, uh, I think, believe it, if I remember right, it's the black squirrel, it's over in Colorado, and they need a clumping aspect for their habitat, which is different than most squirrels and stuff that I know of. Uh, but I see that it has somewhat of a park-like nature to it, but not a park-like nature to it. And when I say park-like, I'm talking about one that's relatively clean throughout the forest floor, but it's not mature trees and nothing else under it. So I see a component of both the understory, the mid-level story, and the upper story. That's kind of what I would envision. Well, I've worked in forests, and I've seen forests all over the world. Um, if the soil is protected, um, then you've got the trees will grow in spite of uh, people. Um, so I like I like forests that are a range of different age classes of trees. Uh, you know, I've spent time in strictly old growth forests, and they are very nice. But I like the variety that you get from a range of different age classes. So I like to see young forests growing. Uh, they're called cereal stages, early cereal stages. Um, I like the mature uh, old growth forests too. But I like the variety. So if you give me the variety and you preserve the the f productivity of the soil, then that would encompass my views of what are necessary for a healthy forest. As a good silviculturist, I will always say it depends. The ideal forestry, I can't comment on an ideal forest until you give me some idea of management goal. What is the goal and purpose of this forest? And I would like to think of a spectrum of forests. And so to answer the question, I would need to know, is this forest being sustained as a park? Is it being managed for diverse multiple uses? Is it primarily a watershed? And so on. And then the silver cultures in me can say, given this need or identification of what a forest is, then I can perhaps address what might be ideal. But I would have to hasten to add that it's an identifying ideal forest is not a technical issue. Uh, it has 
societal components in it as well. And so in building this concept of idealism, I need to say, for whom is the forest serving? What's its purpose? So I can't talk about the issue until we've cleared away some of this background. It's, what is it we're talking about? And the bottom line, I think, for me is I, my sense of ideal would be a mosaic across the landscape. So give me the Sierra Nevada. I would try and view it as a changing, dynamic mosaic, not static. It's changing over time. So if you had a time-lapse camera on the Sierra Nevada, the way it looks and the species composition and its structure uh, and its presence on the landscape will change over time, particularly if you include wildfire uh, and pests, etc., which throw in some random noise. And so I think the issue of idealism is a wonderful philosophical concept. It should, I would find it difficult to answer in a, in a, in a more simplistic way.